Testing one, two. Testing one, two. You good? Good morning. I'm Councilman Chaim, I'm Councilman Bechaim Dayit, Chair of the Committee of Veterans. Thank you all for joining us today. I first want to acknowledge the presence of the military veterans and advocates who have joined us uh, today. Uh, thank you for taking the time to attend this, this hearing. As you know, this coming Monday is Memorial Day, and this is an opportunity for the entire country to pause and remember those in the armed forces who gave their lives in service to this country. We only have the freedoms we cherish because of their sacrifice and the sacrifices of everyone who has served in our military. Let us observe a moment of silence in tribute to the men and women in uniform who we have lost. So please rise and let's take a moment of silence. Thank you. <clears throat> in honor of Memorial Day, the committee will be hearing three important pieces of legislation, two of which explicitly recognize veterans for their service and valor. As one which supports the city and veterans, advocates and efforts to provide veterans with the best possible services. These three pieces of legislation are Resolution 844, introduced by Councilmember Cabrera, a resolution recognizing the 75th anniversary, anniversary of D-Day, and Resolution 568, introduced by Councilmember Rosenthal, which calls on the Veterans Administration to name its hospital in Manhattan after the American Revolutionary War hero, Margaret Corbin, and a pre-considered introduction sponsored by Councilmember Amprey Samuel, which would make public the report from the Mayor's Office of Operations on veterans receiving certain city services. Resolu Resolution 844 recognizes the 75th anniversary of D-Day, June 6, 1944, a pivotal day in history and the turning point in World War II. I've mentioned before that throughout World War II, my father was imprisoned in three concentration camps, including Auschwitz. D-Day is personally significant to me, as well as thousands of Holocaust survivors and des their descendants, because it was a day that helped in the form of 156,000 Allied troops landed on the shores of Normandy. More than 4,000 troops are estimated to have been killed in the battle on that day alone. Resolution 568 calls for the VA hospital here in Manhattan to be named for the Revolutionary War hero and the first ever female member of the United States military, Margaret Corbin. Renaming the hospital for Margaret Corbin would honor the dedication of hundreds of thousands of women who have and continue to serve in the armed forces. Additionally, female veterans often report feeling disenfranchised when seeking treatment at a VA hospital. This resolution aims to acknowledge the equal rights to services and highlight women's contributions to the military. Finally, the pre-considered introduction we will hear today was born from advocate's testimony to this committee in October of 2018. At the hearing, advocates testified that the Veterans Service Report, submitted by the Mayor's Office of Operations Persuades to Local Law 24 of 2015, was not publicly available. This legislation would make that report available publicly on DVS's website. This will ensure transparency in the reporting of what city service veterans are receiving and allow for public to better understand how these services are used by veterans and their families. Ultimately, this report could lead to meaningful policy changes. I would like to thank the Veterans Committee staff, our counsel, Nuzad Chowdhury, our new po policy analyst, Kevin Kat Katowski, and our new finance analyst, Andrew Wilbur. Before we, oh, and I want to thank uh, Tova. Where's Tova? She's here somewhere. She left her name out. Before we begin, I'd like to read a statement from Council Member Fernando Cabrera, who could not be with us today. Statement from Committee Veterans, Resolution 844-2019, recognizing the 75th anniversary of D-Day, Tuesday, May 21st, 2019. Resolution 0844-2019 by Councilmember Cabrera recognizes the 75th anniversary of D-Day, 
when on June 6, 1944, more than 156,000 American, British, and Canadian soldiers landed on five beaches in Normandy, supported by more than 5,000 ships and 13,000 aircraft. More than 2,200 Allied bombers attacked enemy targets both along the coast and inland. D-Day marked the beginning of the final phase of World War II in which the Allies drove the Nazis out of Western Europe before accepting their surrender on May 8, 1945. This historic event helped to shape our country and further affirmed our commitment to freedom and democracy. Councilmember Cabrera asked for the committee's favorable consideration of this resolution. So before uh, we begin, I'd like to ask council to swear in um, our panel. Oh, so you want to? Yes. So we're going to have uh, Alika Ampri Samuel um, to say a few words on her bill. Go ahead. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Chair Deutsch, for allowing me this opportunity to speak on my bill. And I'm very honored and excited about being a new member of the Veterans Committee. This is actually my first hearing as a committee member. Um, so my bill will require the Department of Veterans Services to make publicly available on its website the report on veterans receiving certain services required by Local Law 23 of 2015. Um, this law states that the City of New York must be transparent regarding veterans served by our city agencies. And I just want to um, just give a little bit of um, context as to where I'm coming from. So during a public hearing, um, your hearing, February 26, early this year, I highlighted my experiences as the spouse of a disabled vet who's receiving services right here in New York City. My husband, who was a recipient of a Bronze Star who fought in both Iraq and Afghanistan, um, found it very challenging to maneuver through the systems and the bureaucracy between the federal government and the city systems. And just being a wife and well-connected, I found it difficult as well. And so I, you know, I, I figured if I'm having difficulties as someone well-informed, I can only imagine um, what the other military families are going through and the veterans themselves. And so um, we live in a world of being able to um, receive information um, and be transparent. The city, we're always trying to be transparent and because we always go to the um, social media and always look on the website. It just makes sense to be able to have reports readily available online so that we can see what's going on and be able to utilize that information in the council so we can see how we can be of best service for our veterans and our families. And so it's just coming from, of course, a personal experience, but it's something that I see every single day amongst my constituency. Um, and so um, that's what the bill is about. And um, I can't wait to hear your opinion, and thank you for the time. Thank you, and that came straight from your heart because you have a prepared speech, and you spoke straight from the heart. <laughs> as <is. laughs> uh, please raise your uh, right hand. Do you s affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee, and to respond honestly to committee council members? Thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the Committee on Veterans, uh, Chair Deitch, and bill sponsors, uh, Council Member Ambry Samuel. Welcome to the Committee on Veterans. Um, and I want to acknowledge Council Member Rosenthal and Council Member Herb Cabrera, who could not be here today. My name is Alexis Wachowski. I am proud to serve as Associate Commissioner for Public Affairs at the New York City Department of Veterans Services. And I'm joined today by E. Cecil Henry, General Counsel and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at DVS. On behalf of Commissioner Lori Sutton and DVS, we would like to extend our appreciation for the citywide enthusiasm and support for New York City's upcoming Fleet Week and Memorial Day events. Every day we see our city wrap its arms closer around our veteran community in a collective effort to become more military friendly. We are pleased to be with you here today to discuss the package of proposals before this committee and advocate on behalf of our city's veterans and their families. I would like now to address the proposed pre-considered legislation T2019-4398, which would require the Department of Veterans Services to make publicly available on its website the report on veterans receiving certain city services as required by Local Law 23 of 2015. 
Local Law 23 of 2015, first introduced by Council Member Paul Vallone, requires the Mayor's Office of Operations to report in writing on the total of number of veterans and their spouses who have applied for and been approved for Mitchell Lama Housing. Number two, the total number of fee-exempt mobile food vending licenses and food vending permits issued by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to veterans. Number three, the number of general vending licenses issued by the Dis Department of Consu Consumer Affairs to veterans. Number four, the total number of veterans who submitted an application to DCA for a general vending license. Number five, the total number of veterans residing in the city who utilized a HUD bash voucher. And number six, the total number of veterans applicants for the veterans civil service credit for civil service examinations. Local Law 23 increases awareness about the city services for veterans and their families by requiring that the Office of Operations provide this report to three entities. Number one, to DVS. Number two, to the New York City Veterans Advisory Board, an independent council whose members, appointed by both the city council and the mayor, advocate for veterans throughout the five boroughs. And number three, the city council itself. The report identified in this resolution is already available to the public through multiple channels enumerated above. DVS shares the reports with our partners. The 11 members of the VAB share the report as they deem appropriate, and we do not know to whom the council speaker's office disseminates the report. But DVS is proud to advance transparency for our constituents through dissemination of this and other relevant reporting about New York City's veteran population. We will continue to share the report when requested and hope the city council takes similar steps and we're happy to work with the council to take further steps towards our shared goals. I would like now to address the resolutions proposed today. 0568 of 2018 proposed by Council Member Rosenthal and 0844 2019 proposed by Council Member Cabrera. Resolution 0568 2018 aligns with DVS's missions to serve all New York City veterans, including traditionally under-recognized populations such as women veterans. Since the inception of our nation, women have served, whether by fighting on the battlefield themselves or provi providing essential assistance that made it possible for others to do so. Margaret Corbin exemplifies the spirit of service that will inspire future generations of women to similarly serve their country. It is only fitting that we honor her service and sacrifice, and indeed the contributions of all women service members and veterans, with the renaming of one of our nation's most essential institutions dedicated to veterans care, the VA. Resolution 0844-2019 honors the thousands of brave Americans and allied soldiers whose courage turned the tide of history 75 years ago this June. In President Dwight D. Eisenhower's letter distributed to the 175,000 member expeditionary force on the eve of the invasion, he wrote, the eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty loving people everywhere march with you. This resolution honors the spirit of those words ensuring that the eyes of the world remain upon the courageous soldiers who fought in defense of the liberties we hold dear. In conclusion, DVS applauds the City Council for its leadership in formally recognizing the dignity of our brothers and sisters in service over the course of history. We look forward to the continued partnership of the Council in advocating for veterans and their families in New York City. We thank you for this opportunity to meet today, and at this time, I would be happy to address your questions. Thank you. Um, so, Local Law 23, um, you mentioned that you already um, disseminate this information. So, according to the, um, this bill, it's to report it in writing, right? So, you did mention that DVS shares the reports with our partners and 11 members of the VAB. Um, so, how, how, how difficult would it be to, um, I mean, is this in writing? Like. Who do, you, who do you send it to? Tell me exactly the procedure of how you share it. So I don't have a list of the people who we've shared the report with. Um, we get the report as at the same time we presume as the other members of, uh, the other recipients of the report, which is the City Council Speaker's Office and the 11 members of the VAB. So you share it with the City Council Speaker's Office? No, sorry. This report is not produced by DVS. This report is produced by the Mayor's Office of Operations. They send it to DVS, so we're the recipients of the okay. report, as is the City Council Speaker's Office and the members of the VAB. Okay. Um, is it also on DVS's um, website? Not is at this time. Okay. So, okay, so according to this bill, maybe 
you, you're, you're basically saying that's already been reporting reported, so you don't support this vote, right? No, what we're saying is that D DVS is not the owner of the report. We don't produce the report. We are recipients of the report. Um, we understand that the intention of this bill is to increase transparency, yes. and we're happy to work with the council to figure out the best ways to ensure that we can increase transparency. Okay, so through this bill that this is <laughs> to increase transparency, right? Yeah. So let's, let's do that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so why, so if you're getting it from the mayors of, um, mayor of, mayors of operation, then now you have in your possession, and the, the role of DVS is to disseminate the information, right? So right. what We're is the big deal that if you receive this information to properly put it on your website, to disseminate the information, opposed to saying that DVS shares the report with our partners? So, so obviously it's not enough, right? Sure, and we are happy to discuss the best way to get it online, whether it's through our offices or through the Mayor's Office of Operations. One of the things we wanted to make sure that was understood was that we don't produce the report ourselves. That's fine, but a lot of things, a lot of things DVS doesn't produce, right? So you get information, you may get it from different sources, yes. and then part of DVS's job is to properly disseminate this information, right? So. No one is denying that you're not getting, that you're not producing uh, this information, but you are receiving it. So once you receive it, now as part of DVS, um, Department of Veteran Services, now it's your role to take that information, whatever information you receive, whether it's from the city, from the state, from the federal government, mm -hmm. now the job of DVS, that's what the role of DVS is, is to then properly disseminate the information and to have transparency all around. So if you are interested in having conversations, then you would support this bill and say this is a great bill, and that now let's sit down with Alika Amprey Samuel and let's figure out how we could do better. And uh, we agree, we think uh, we're happy to discuss uh, all the ways that transparency is currently achieved uh, throughout the through uh, all the enumerated partners. Uh, we'd love to, you know, what uh, methods the city council you know, uh, uses to disseminate this report also when it receives it. Uh, and we'd love to talk about what the best effective ways in the future might be to get this report out, whether it's uh, through the city council's website or us or ops. Uh, we'd love to continue those conversations with you down the road. So one thing I, I'm not sure of is that if DVS is, would love to have these conversations and they would support this bill and then say, look, we're, we'd love to have a conversation. We're supporting this bill. It's a great bill. Let's have these conversations. But if you're going to say let's have these conversations without supporting a bill that leads to these conversations, and then it's a problem. I think that conversations are evolving, and this is the beginning of the conversation. We thank Councilmember Amprey Samuel for bringing this and bringing this to, to light, to, to, for starting this discussion. And uh, as you mentioned, this is, this is the beginning of the conversation, and we look forward to where it evolves. So why isn't DVS supporting this? So there, there is not, uh, this is not to say that DVS does not support the spirit of the bill. The challenge is, this is not something that DVS owns. But and not so everything does DVS own. So we want to make sure that we are the appropriate parties to disseminate this broadly. Um, because there are, we are one of three recipients. The city council is a recipient, the VAB is a recipient, and DVS is a recipient. So we want to have conversations to ensure that we are the best vehicle to uh, post this publicly on our website. Um, the other element is we can't control the necessarily the uh, the timing or the context that is provided with the report itself. So we want to make sure that we have um, the appropriate um, conversations to make sure that this is the, the, the right path forward. So I just want to say this was supposed to be a very short hearing. <laughs> um, and can you explain to everyone what is the role of DBS? So I, just to clarify, we do support the bill. We do support the idea of putting this information out. We want to make sure that it's understood, though, that we don't own the report itself. 
and we don't own the data that is produced in the report. Does DBS own all the information that they disseminate and all the information that you give out and you let people know what services DBS does and what services and resources veterans are, are eligible for? No, we yes or no? No. No. So again, um, I understand that DBS doesn't own this information. Okay. So just like everything else that DVS does not own, and the role of DVS is to disseminate information properly. This way, all advocates and veterans understand what resources are available. So you just said you do support the bill before on the testimony. You really don't support the bill because you're already doing this, but obviously you're not doing enough. So, so how can we get DVS to support this bill? I would say in the conversations that directly precede this hearing, uh, as we mentioned before, this is the beginning of the conversation, these are the beginning of the discussions, and we're happy to talk about you know, what the next steps might be. Uh, and as we continue along you know, this, this bill's progression throughout the city council. So um, I will not accept that because I'm still waiting to receive answers from the last hearing. <laughs> There's some outstanding um, questions that I had in the last hearing, and I only received half those responses. So offline, I'm having difficulties receiving responses. Um, I could print it out if you want, and I could bring it down here. Um, can you print it out, Tom? Okay. And I'll send you what you did respond from the last hearing and what you didn't respond from the last hearing, and that's supposed to be an offline conversation. And council member, we'd be glad to have those discussions with you, but we'd love to actually talk about the crux of this uh, hearing. Uh, so we, we, we're fine to follow up on those uh, items we believe are still outstanding, but for right now, I think it's most appropriate that we focus on the bill at hand. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also most appropriate that we again highlight that we are uh, interested in talking about how we can achieve greater transparency further on a lot down the line. But by not by not supporting this bill, it's not uh, you're not proving that you want to have conversations about this. I'm gonna I'm gonna have I'm gonna have my colleague ask questions before I continue. Thank you for your questions, Council Member. And if I could make one more clarifying remark, we agree with the idea that this uh, information be, should be shared publicly, should be transparent. There are some details that we want to make sure that we are clear on, for instance, about the date, um, about adding <coughs> contextual information perhaps that might make it more useful. So those kinds of details we think are important to include in posting this information. Yeah, so usually when a bill is passed, then there's conversations between the city council and DVS and the mayor's office regarding to what you just mentioned. Mm -hmm going through, okay, what needs to be reported and, and how, how, ca how can we do better. But if you don't support the bill, it's like there's nothing to talk about. Okay, we, we, we're gonna do what we, we're go we are going to do whatever we want to do. So you have to give something and then we could have a conversation, exactly what you just mentioned. Okay, how, how is this bill gonna work, right? Again, I, I don't think that's quite reflective of how conversations work, but uh, again, we are uh, more than happy to uh, talk about how we can reach a mu mutually beneficial arrangement for this particular bill. So in this administration, even when we pass bills, it's difficult for this administration even to implement those bills. I still have bills that were passed that we're still waiting for the administration to implement, and that's with, and that's with passing bills. Imagine if we don't pass it, it's never going to get done. Um, so I'm going to go to my colleague, but first I want to recognize um, Council Member Paul Ballone. Thank you. And I'll go to Alika Amphrey Samuel. <laughs> so um, on February 26th, when you held the hearing um, and I had a couple of questions, I remember the film that I have now is the same exact film that I had on February 26th because I sat and I remember saying it's been an hour and a half and I've been listening to the Commissioner um, Sutton just talk about all of these great things that DVS was doing on behalf of veterans and families in New York City. And we heard over and over and over about programs and, and tabling and, and I remember saying, I've been sitting for an hour and a half and I don't feel anything that you're saying. That's what I said to the Commissioner at that time. And I said, and I definitely don't feel the impact in my community. And so I thought this particular bill was just kind of like a, a no-brainer 
like, you know, just post it on the website, you know, just report out on, um, you know, the, the local law so that we can know what's happening and figure out where there are gaps and how we can be helpful. And so to hear, oh, you know, we're supportive of the essence or the spirit of the bill. I'm like, come on, what kind of, like, literally, it sounds like bureaucratic, like, crap. Right, because I also heard you say a couple of times, um, you know, we send this to the speaker's office, and so the count, the city council has it. So what are you doing with that information? And that's exactly what I said in February, that the veterans and the families who are going to, um, uh, you know, figure out where resources are, some of them may be able to go online. But to say that I'm going to go to my elected official to figure out how to run around and, and get my, you know, services as a veteran, that's, that's crazy to even think that that's something that would happen because that's not what, it, that's not what they do. Like they go and, you know, they deploy all over the world and, is, and they're connected to the federal government. And then when they come home, there's still that connection to the federal government and they're trying to figure out what's available to them as veterans, and there are programs and resources supposedly that are available to them, but it's not getting to them, it's not reaching them. So then to think that there should be some kind of third parties involved to be a connection between the city, I said in February, you know, what's the direct connection to the veterans? Like, have you decided to set up a table um, in the VA hospital on a daily basis or in the, the VA office downtown Manhattan? I said that in February. And so to me, it's like, um, like sh just, just, you know, saying something is the case and it's not really that. And so this would really make it transparent. And if you're doing the work and you want to do the work and, you know, you're supportive of the spirit of it, then just do it. That's the part I don't understand right now. And it's very frustrating because, again, I'm a member of the New York City Council. You know, and my husband now, who's part of the Foreign Service, who's still a disabled veteran, we st when he comes home, we still have to go to 23rd Street. And I'm still sitting in the lobby looking at all the other veterans who have, you know, sacrificed their, 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 their lives. They're, they sacrifice everything for this country. And then they're sitting in New York City, which is like the greatest city in America. And we have agencies that are in place that's supposed to help them, but they're not getting that on the ground. So I really don't understand how, like, this is this is this can't be done. If there's a website and you receive a report, then put the the information on the website. What's the difficulty there? So thank thank you for um, sharing all of this with us. And we this is something that we can do, and this is something that we want to explore with the best way to do. Um, just from my perspective, and public affairs and communications. I wanna make sure that whatever we put on our website is the most useful information possible. Um, the report- So what can you put on a website? Because you're public, pu public relations and public affairs and so communications, so you're the experts at this. This is why you're sitting at the table right now. So explain to us what can be put on the website right now. What I think is the most useful information to put on the website is information that has context. And- So give me an example. So an example would be, for instance, the reasons why um, some metrics go up or go down as is reported in this particular document that we're talking about, the Mayor's Office of Operations report. I would wanna know, well, why do those numbers go up and down? What, what does it mean? What do these numbers mean? Where's the context that explains what this is? This report doesn't have any sort of context. And so we would love to work with you to determine the best way to present this information so that it's actually useful to the veterans and their family members who are getting the information. So la so in February, I talked about two families, two veteran families that are homeless, and I talked about one that lived in an abandoned building, right? And since that hearing, I was told, when I walked out of that hearing, I was told, you know what, give me the information of that family so we can make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. The city went to that, that building and said, none of these families are supposed to be in here. Everybody got to get out and go back to the pathways, go back through the shelter system from the beginning. And they put the families in the even worse situation they, than they were in before I sat here and, and, and spoke about their situations. And they called me angry. So then I had to get all other kind of people involved to, to, you know, to assist the family and then get on the phone and say, what the hell were y'all thinking when y'all went out there, right? And so 
I would like, so I wanted to know how many families are in the shelter system who are veterans and how many of them have applied for services or, or um, vouchers or um, you know, housing through DVS. And then get that information and post online so we can know what you're doing and know, you know, if there's 200 families and only two of them receive something, you know, a voucher. So what's the problem here? Do we need to get more funding for housing for specifically for veteran families? So why is that difficult? Why do we need like a fancy matrix to figure out what the problem is? Why we can't just report the actual numbers? So it is possible to report the numbers. It is possible to report the numbers. But I'm saying that from my perspective, having worked in the field of communications for a long time, numbers by themselves don't tell the whole story and it doesn't provide necessarily the most useful information. So what we would like to do is work with you to figure out, for instance, from your perspective, if you're saying just the numbers alone are enough, then we, I hear you, I hear you on that. If you're saying that you have, that the reason for this report to be posted online is so that you can have a better understanding of what's happening then I think there needs to be more context provided with these numbers. But the challenge is, is that we don't produce this report. So for us to find that context means a different, a, a different kind of um, uh, partnership, which we're happy to explore. But it's just, I think that it's not as straightforward as just posting the numbers. That's the perspective that um, and so, and the, and the problem is we got too many smart people around the table trying to make decisions as to what should be transparent or not, right? And I'm sorry to even, like, take up too much time, and I'll, I'll end it. all day. Okay. <laughs> I, and and, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong. Like, I think that's the problem because, um, you know, I've – I've been in the social service field and I, and I get you know, that it's, it's difficult to be able to look at numbers and, and speak to what the numbers are because there's so much context around it. But at the same time, numbers are important and you can have that conversation about the numbers in another like round table discussion, but we first need to know what the numbers are and report that out to the people, right? Because if you're not being transparent, then you're having all these conversations trying to figure things out around the table and you never figure it out because people are jumping from one administration to the next. Because once, you know, when, when a new mayor's in place or a new speaker, I don't know, whoever's in place, things change. And then now we got to have this next conversation again starting in 2021, where it's just report the damn numbers, and, excuse me, just report the numbers, and we talk about the numbers Love and it. figure this out. You were where I was four years ago, which is when we first came in, there was not a number anywhere to be found. And these old, well, they're old now, three years ago when we passed these bills, was the first attempt, I guess, post office to actual agency to actually start this process. And it, it, it's frustrating, but a lot of it, what I've seen is it's sometimes unfair to this group because they're so small. And a lot of the work that's being done is other interagency work that we don't, we want to know. Remember the mental health hearing we had last month when mm -hmm. you were explaining to me about your health? They didn't have any information because it was coming from DOH, it wasn't coming from DVS. So, so much work has to be done to get veterans the resources and the cooperation from the other agencies to get them this data that we want to see so we can plan help legislate. And I, I feel it. So I'm agreeing with you and everything. It's just we've had this conversation time and time again. We're getting there because where we were four years ago was an office with three people. Mm -hmm. And now there's actually an agency. But we're getting there. An agency with a website. So one of the things And we just want the information on the website. Yes. Sounds One like of the things I wanted thing. to remind the council about was that we do have a new local law, Local Law 44, which is enacting, uh, requiring the agency to report on our numbers on a yearly basis, I believe in December uh, of every year. So between the PMMR, the MMR, and the Local Law 44, there'll be these three points in time over the course of the year where we will be reporting ro on robust figures that the agency either produces itself or has um, uh, access to from other agencies. So it's not that we are number resistant or uh, opposed to posting numbers. Um, we want to make sure we're in compliance with the reporting requirements that we have. And we look forward to compiling this information for the report in, in, in December. Yeah, and it's a reminder that it's actually advocates that were you know, asking for this information to be online. You know, and you know, I know it mentioned um, in your testimony. You know, who gets it? The eleven members of the VAB, and you know, as they deem appropriate, and 
um, you know, report with your partners, you know, but so it's like so many advocates. So I, I understand, and I think that one of the, um, what we, we've made our clear our concerns about the context around the numbers. We also hear you when you say that we need the numbers as a starting point, and so I think we can support that and move forward to figure out how to provide the best context to put on our website to make the numbers make sense. And I think that DDS can support that. Thank you. Mr. Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. I know it came in a little late, but I, I know we were discussing the current bill and the resolutions and where we went from the past bill. So um, I guess it's interesting to, to absolutely so supporting any time we can continue to grow this. Um, I think I just, I guess because for the last four years, and that's why we were having that conversation, can bring a little bit of the consoling for you on how much you've done over the last couple of years to get to this point. But what we're asking for is, is the continued frustration that you see because so little was accounted for before. There's so much information now that we need to get this data. Otherwise, we can't. And just like the council member said, if, sh if we wait for the next administration, who knows what the focus is going to be. And we never had a veterans agency until we decided four years ago it was time to do that. So even last month's hearing with the chair on focusing on mental health, and Alika telling about us, her husband and what he's went through, and then so much of that data wasn't in your hands, it was in other agencies. And I think that's where there's continuous bills coming out, whether it's DIFTA or whether it's here saying, you need this data, you're the veterans agency. And if another, whether it's Thrive or Department of Buildings or housing or whatever aspect a veteran is applying for for services, you need to know that. You need to know the case management file that was set up. You need to be notified. You need to keep the list for that. And it needs to be done, not just thrown on your desk, but giving you the tools to handle it. And that's what this committee is here to do. And whether it's budget season, to make sure you get more, because what you do with the pennies you have is crazy for the amount of veterans that we're working on. But we want to continue to grow that and give you the tools to need it to get this data so that it's just like, yeah, it's more than the data. It's the context, too. But first, we need some data to figure out the context. So I think it's a, it's a continuing road. So I support these um, like we've done in the past. And I think if you could, you were saying in your perspective how you were. And the one question would be just to see then what would you do differently? What would I do differently with respect to this mm -hmm. reporting requirement? I think that I would refer back to the agency that produces the report. Um, they're the ones that gather the data. They're the ones that produce the report. They're the ones that release the report. And so I would ask, would they not be an agency or an office that is better positioned to release the report? Um, we don't have control, for instance, over the timing of when it comes out, um, how robust the data that is uh, included in the report, whether there's any contextual information provided. I, from my own perspective as a communications professional, would want to see. Yeah, but then that would, that, would, that would be the same. That would be circumventing every agency and every hearing that we're having, saying depend on the company that's actually doing the report. That, that just can't work. That's otherwise, city agencies in whole, we would never be able to hold them accountable because they say, well, that company did the work, so let's find out. It, it, that's not the answer that we can work with because it doesn't work in the system that we're handed. So you, we have to be responsible for the, the contractor and the RFP that's out and who does the work and gives us the data. Then we have to take that data and make it our own and figure out how to do that. So you've got to be able to do that with this information. Mm -hmm. And if they're not turning it around, then of course we'll stand with you on either never hurting that company again or find out what happened to the information. But you're not alone on agencies being dependent on someone else's data. But we need that. So when we're getting yelled at together, we go back to the company and say, hey, listen, I can't show up at this hearing without that data. So yeah. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So in other words, so. You support the bill now, right? I'm not leaving until you support this bill. I'm telling you right now. I got it all day. I'll, I'll sit here till Memorial Day. We, we support the fact that this was made, uh, it's brought to, the brought to the forefront, that this has not become a, a busk issue, one that's, one that's uh, loud and visible. And now that it is, uh, we can go about talking about what the best ways for transparency might be. As Councilmember Malone said, working with our stakeholder agencies, working with you, working with our advocates. Let's talk about how we can really come to uh, uh, a resolution that benefits the veterans community, the agencies, the city council, everyone involved. Uh, so we support the fact that 
this is the beginning of a conversation that will eventually lead to something productive. So do you support this bill? <laughs> yes or no? We support that this be <laughs> that. No, that it's, uh, do you support this bill? Councilman, again, I think we've- We're gonna say all day. Okay. Do you support this bill? Does DBS support this bill? DBS's job, their role is to disseminate information to advocates. So we don't have to work with the mayor's office. DBS needs to work with the mayor's office to come up what should be reported and how it should be reported and what more information you need. But first we need to start by agreeing that this is important and that DVS supports the bill and then we could discuss what information we need to get in order to disseminate. So now if you have a veteran that needs information and we say, oh, go on DVS's website, oh, but it's not there. It's not there. It should be, but it's not. So it's important for DVS to support this bill, and then you could have conversations with the mayor's office, you could have conversations with advocates, you could have conversations with council members who are sitting here today, and then we could work out of what needs to be in the body of that bill in order to have the proper information like you mentioned, Alexis. Mm -hmm. So do you support this bill? Who makes the decision before you got here? Who, who made a decision to, um, not to support this bill. Whose decision was that? Council Member, when we evaluate a bill, we draw in, we, we take the input from our stakeholder agencies, we take the input uh, from uh, our agency leadership, we, we gauge what the uh, purpose, what the impact of the bill might be, and we discuss whether that's the, the most proper way to achieve the goals that you know, they, it may set out to be. So who makes and the ultimate decision? Before you, before you walked in here today, who typed up this paper? The, the ultimate decision. Who made the decision for whatever is written on your test on, on your testimony? The ultimate decision on what eventually passes through the city council is a result of discussions which happen with the mayor's office, with uh, relevant stakeholder agencies, with the city council, and uh, we look forward to what the ultimate disposition of this so, might be. So why isn't anyone here from the mayor's office testifying? If they were, if, they, if they're part of the decision um, on these bills and not to support it, which is pretty much like um, Alika mentioned, it's common sense. Why isn't someone here from the mayor's office to give me more details of why they are giving DVS this information that we're not supporting this bill because it's not something that needs to be done? So you know, we support the bill in its intent, like any bill, like any other bill, but uh, there's a legislative process which you are well uh, acquainted with, well apprised of, and we look forward to engaging in that with you. So can we move this to the next stated meeting? I think we can move with this to, I think we can move this offline to discussions between your office, our office, uh, the stakeholder agencies. We so can you, that's the next step in so this So you want to get process. back on offline? You sure you want to get to that? Because we could sit here for another two hours and I have the email printed, I'm still waiting for information. Great. We'll, we'll, we'll have that conversation with you offline, Council Member. And, so, thank you, okay. and thank you for your questions. As we're heading into Memorial Day. Yeah. It's also being okay. Protective. And family should be dis it should, should feel disrespectful. Alika, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, don't turn your mic. Oh. <laughs> like, like, you know, we're, we're smiling, you know, um, but I, f like, I feel disrespected right now. So, like, this is so important to me. My husband right now is in the airport because he was gonna be here, right? But this, this, this hearing was scheduled for one o'clock, right? And my husband was at, he, so my husband is getting here at one, so it's gonna be late because they had to push it up to 10 o'clock. But that's how important this is. And the advocates who, who were pushing for this, just to have the information placed on a website, right? It's so disrespectful to me because it's like playing games. It's like we hear it, and this is just, we hear it over and over and over. And I'm not the controversial kind of person. That's not me. I just like to work and, and that's it, get things done. But to me, I feel like this is disrespectful to the people who have given their all to this country. And all we're asking for is for the DVS to put information that you receive on the website so that partners advocacy groups, the council, and anyone else who cares about veterans and their families could have the information that they need to provide them with the services and resources they need. 
Plain and simple. So I would like to take a 10 minute recess. Um, so maybe DVS can make some phone calls and we'll, con we'll reconvene in, in 10 minutes. So now it is 10.50. We will uh, reconvene and have testimony from our advocates. We'll come back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Okay. Um, thank you very much. So, um, so I just want to um, ask the panel regarding Local Law 23, um, if you could believe, if you believe that we can reach um, uh, an agreement or get to support from DVS, Department of Veterans Services, in supporting Local Law 23 to bring transparency and um, to everyone, to advocates, to veterans, and uh, in ensuring that information gets disseminated uh, properly, uh, especially in DVS, DVS's website in, in regards to the working with the mayor, uh, mayor's office of operations and getting this information to the Department of Veterans Services so we could better get this information out uh, to the public. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you, Bill Sponsor, uh, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel. Uh, so we uh, do support the aims, the intents, the goals of the bill, and with a few tweaks, with some uh, with some adjustments, I think we can have a bill uh, ready for passage. Thank you. Um, if, I, if I may, yeah, sure, of course. I wanted to address uh, Council Member Amphrey Samuel, um, especially this sense that you feel um, disrespected, and as a new member of the of the Committee on Veterans. This is distressing to us, and we want to make sure that we work with you collaboratively to come up with solutions that will make uh, our work together be the most productive for veterans and their families. Um, my whole perspective on this particular bill has been to make sure we provide context so that people who aren't just looking at a sheet of numbers, but they have an understanding of what they mean. So uh, we look forward to working with your office to achieve those goals. And uh, Chair Deitch, we will uh, follow up with your office in regards to those other outstanding items that you brought to our attention as well. Thank, thank you, for you that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. Happy Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day to thank you, too. You. Thank, thank you, so, you much so much for the support of our veterans. Thank, thank you. you. So our first panel, I'd like to uh, call up Alexis Wachowski. Oh, that's you. Sorry, I didn't know your last name. <laughs> Alexis. Okay. Um, Coco. Uh, Samantha. Vadim and uh, uh, Kristen. So let's just get one more chair up there, and we'll have everyone come up one time. Uh, hi, I'm Coco Colhane, the founder and director of the Veteran Advocacy Project. We provide free legal services to veterans and their families. Um, I just wanted to point out that this original bill, when Paul Vallone introduced it about four years ago, I think, included information on HRA, and a lot of advocates in the community testified um, saying that it really doesn't go far enough, and by the time it made it to the mayor's desk, it was HRA was taken out, right? So there's so much valuable data that's not being collected that could be, um, there's just no reason. I mean, we have a veterans job center. We should be tracking how many veterans are coming through there, how many veterans are on public benefits, what, what is the need. I mean, this is so crucial to how we fund services for veterans, how we, you know, plan programming. It's something that DVS should be asking for. It's just, there's so much more data that should be, regardless of whether or not it's DVS or the mayor's office, whomever it is, can be worked out. Um, but there's just there's an opportunity to really better inform our services, our budgets, all of our efforts, and we hope that somebody <laughs> push in, create you know even take the bill even further and ask for even more data, so, and be tracking other things like uh, hospitals, how many veterans are going into emergency rooms. I mean these things are just so crucial to how we support the entire veteran community in New York. Thank you. We uh, took note of what you just said, and we're going to send it over to DVS and start DVSing. Go ahead. Uh, 
Um, good morning and thank you for the opportunity. I'm here to speak regarding the renaming of the VA hospital in Manhattan to the Margaret Cochran Corbin campus. Uh, my name is Samantha Kubek and I'm a staff attorney in the Legal Health Division of the New York Legal Assistance Group. This year, Legal Health's Veterans Initiative will serve nearly 1,000 veterans. I staff the nation's first legal clinics exclusively for women veterans, the first of which was opened at the Manhattan VA. We created these clinics in response to the growing need of our women veteran clients. Women veterans are the fastest growing veteran population, but as more women veterans return to civilian life, many are facing new battles at home. My clinics opened with the goal to provide a safe space for women veterans that would be uniquely theirs, and in so doing, help to make them feel more comfortable in the VA's male-dominated atmosphere. I've seen, the first, I've seen firsthand the ways in which providing a welcoming environment to women veterans can change the extent of our reach. Since 2015, Legal Health has held Know Your Rights trainings at the VA hospital. About 60 veterans would attend each event, yet at most only one or two women would come. To combat this, we created a new training specifically for women veterans. We advertise the event as targeted to women veterans, and we plan to address topics commonly of issue to women. On December 12, 2016, we held the first Women Veterans Legal Stand Down at the Manhattan VA. 35 women attended the event, and many stayed afterwards to comment on how welcome the training was. I continue to hope that my clinic and the ones created in its model since will help to create spaces within the VA where women veterans feel as though they belong, but continued work needs to be done to shift the culture at the VA. New York can play a pivotal and highly visible role in leading this shift by renaming the Manhattan VA after Margaret Corbin. It would be the first VA hospital to be named after a female veteran and signal our commitment to recognizing the existence and importance of women veterans. This credible signaling will usher in a more inclusive VA culture and will aid in the dismantling of harmful cultural barriers. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the council about this issue and engaging in further discussions about women veterans. Thank you. Chairman Deutsch. Oh, great, uh, Chairman Deutsch, uh, Chairwoman Ayala, and distinguished members of the Joint Committee, uh, on behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America and our uh, more than 425,000 members, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify here today. Um, I'm a New Yorker, uh, a naturalized citizen, and a U.S. Army Iraq veteran. Um, at IVA, I'm a master level uh, social worker serving as a senior veteran transition manager uh, with our rapid response referral program. Uh, I'm a veterans, uh, I'm a VA benefit lead, um, and uh, RIP is a high-tech, high-touch referral service for veterans and their families with a comprehensive case management component. Uh, we assist veterans of all eras regardless of discharge status worldwide in uh, uh, confronting significant challenges like unemployment, financial uh, or legal struggles, uh, homelessness, and uh, mental health related issues. To date, RIP has served over 9,000 veterans and family members nationwide and over 1,000 uh, in New York City alone, providing critical support and resources to ensure uh, that this city's veterans' needs are effectively met. Uh, since its beginning, IVA has fought for and has been successful in advocating for policies that are able to meet the needs of our newest generation of veterans on local, state, and federal levels. Our top uh, six legislative priorities for 2019 reflect that. Uh, many of, uh, of the issues we've championed have not uh, been popular in the beginning. Uh, whether it is our stances on don't ask, don't tell, uh, combating the trans ban, uh, women's role in the military, uh, medicinal cannab uh, cannabis for vets, or updating or changing the VA motto to reflect the, the fact that this institution honors uh, the service and sacrifices of women vets. Uh, history has shown uh, we've been on the right side uh, of these issues. We stand by the fact that diversity is a force multiplier for our armed forces and uh, IVA is proud of its record. Uh, despite the ever-growing contribution uh, of women to our national defense, the American public still does not understand the extent of their involvement and sacrifice. Uh, for years, women served in the front lines uh, despite the Pentagon's official ban on women in combat. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, from machine gunners on Humvees, uh, helping secure main supply routes uh, so vital supplies uh, could get where they're going, to Navy explosive ordnance disposal uh, technicians uh, uh, destroying IEDs, weapons caches, and blowing up hinges of doors uh, during raids. They served where needed and, when, uh, and went uh, where the mission demanded. The lack of understanding, unfortunately, has also uh, reverberated uh, through the various systems of care available to them uh, as veterans uh, and uh, has negatively impacted uh, their post-military transition. 
The culture at the VA uh, can seem like an equally unwelcoming place uh, to women who are transitioning. The VA motto does not help. Uh, to ex explicitly, uh, it explicitly excludes women uh, and their survivors from its mandate, and it reads as outdated, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. Women veterans are becoming more prominent in American culture uh, from the growing number of women veterans uh, serving in Congress uh, uh, to the highest uh, leadership positions among service branches and uh, veteran service organizations. Women are stepping up and leading. While more women are joining the military uh, ranks, are filling combat roles at an increasing pace, uh, and assume greater responsibilities in leadership, veteran services uh, for them must stop falling behind uh, what is available uh, to their uh, male brethren. Uh, every woman veteran uh, uh, enters the VA nationwide and are not recognized for their service. Uh, every day, my sisters in arms are looked past in favor uh, uh, in favor of the uh, familiar image of a man serving in uniform. Until this changes, IVA's work will not be done. Uh, almost 250 uh, years after the first woman veteran received her earned benefits uh, from the U.S. government, uh, women veterans are still fighting for recognition. It is past time for women veterans to be recognized for their service and sacrifice, and renaming the Manhattan VA uh, facility to Margaret Corbin VA Medical Center is one step forward in a larger campaign uh, for that recognition. We still have a long way to go so, uh, so that all Americans recognize uh, veterans uh, come in all shapes, uh, sizes, and genders, but this is a step in the right direction. And VA fully supports uh, Resolution 568 to rename uh, the Manhattan VA facility to the Margaret Corbin VA Medical Center. Increased reporting and transparency can allow stakeholders to identify uh, underutilized services uh, and work towards solutions to connect veterans uh, with those services. Uh, the int in front of the committee today, titled uh, A Local Law to Amend the Administrative Code for the, New uh, for the City of New York in relation to making public uh, uh, the Mayor's Office of Operation report on veterans receiving certain city services, uh, would increase transparency and reporting uh, within mayor's office uh, of the Department of Veteran Services. Because this report would focus on a number of critical services for veterans living in NYC, such as uh, the amount of hud -Vash vouchers issued uh, and mitchell -Lama housing applications, IVA supports this legislation. Uh, resolution number uh, four, uh, 844 would officially recognize uh, the 75th anniversary of the D-Day, uh, which occurred on June 6, 1944. Uh, D-Day was the largest amphibious uh, assault in uh, history, led by the Army, by the way, uh, to, eval uh, to eventual liberation of Western Europe. According to the U.S. Uh, National D-Day Memorial, at least 4,400 uh, Americans uh, American service members were killed that day. Uh, despite the high number of casualties, the operation was resounding success and allowed uh, the Allied forces to establish a beachhead in Europe. IVA fully supports the resolution and thanks to uh, thanks the committee for honoring all the men and women uh, that served during D-Day 75 years ago. Members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity uh, to share IVA's views on these issues today. Uh, I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for all the support. Thank you. Good morning, and Good morning. thank you to Chair Deutsch and the committee for the opportunity to, to testify today. My name is Kristen Rouse, and I'm a 25-year year veteran of the United States Army, Army Reserve, and Army National Guard, with service including three tours of duty in Afghanistan. I present testimony today on behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, a member-driven, grassroots, policy advocacy and community building organization that advances veterans and families as civic leaders. I am presenting testimony on behalf of our members who are st active stakeholders in our advocacy. Local Law 23 of 2015 was among the first pieces of legislation we testified strongly in favor of back in 2015 when we were newly formed as the New York City Veterans Alliance. We did so on the basis of an online survey of the New York City veterans community which reflected strong support for better reporting and accountability of the services being delivered for our city's veterans and families. In recent years, we have brought up the lack of transparency in our city's tracking and reporting of this data. We applaud Council Member Amprey Samuel in introducing a bill to make this 
data visible not only within city government, but also to members of the public and our veterans community who have sought information about how our city is serving veterans and families. With veteran homelessness on the rise, and as veterans and their families struggle to find affordable housing, well-paying jobs that value their military service, and the quality of life they deserve, we should be able to see that the city is reporting on and adjusting its delivery of services based on data. Yet as my organization testified back in 2015, the data called for in lo Local Law 23 is really only just the start of ensuring New York City government is more responsive to the needs of the veterans community. In the years since, the New York City Veterans Alliance pushed for veterans and veteran and military status to be included as a protected category of person in the New York City Human Rights Law, which we proudly accomplished with the support of then public advocate Tis James and then council member Jumani Williams and this committee and enshrined in Local Law 119 of 2017. Yet data on this new protected class has not been included in the mandated annual mayor's report on social indicators and equity. Our call for data on veterans, service members, and their families to be included in the mayor's report received a detailed mention in the 2018 report by the mayor's charter Revis revision commission. And I bring this issue to this committee for consideration toward making New York City government more transparent and more responsive to the veterans and military community. Inclusion of data in the mayor's report on social indicators and inequity on veterans, service members, and families related to affordable housing, employment, business ownership, and other indicators tracked by federal and state agencies and prioritized in the past by city government would further inform the policies and programs of city agencies, borough presidents, community boards, and other governmental bodies. It would also have the potential to inform future city planning and land use policy. This reporting would also align the protected status of veterans and military members with other protected classes of person reported in the mayor's report. As we have seen with Local Law 23 of 2015, it takes the whole of our city government to commit to making veterans, service members, and their families a visible demographic in our city's policymaking and delivery of services. We urge passage of Councilmember Amprey Samuel's bill, and we further urge this committee to take on meaningful inclusion of data on what our city government is doing for our community. We further urge this committee to take action to protect and foster growth of the budget for New York City Department of Veterans Services. The mayor's initial budget proposal reflected a cut of $63,000. The mayor's executive budget now cuts DVS's budget by $118,000. On behalf of the members we represent, I state to you that the New York City Veterans Alliance firmly opposes cuts to this young and growing agency. New York City's budget must not be balanced on the backs of veterans and their families, a population that has been underserved for decades by our city's government and that DVS has only begun to reach out to over these last few years. As we testified in March of this year, there is much to be done to ensure DVS and other city agencies are delivering results for our community but we cannot afford to take any steps backward in the funding of this agency. We regret that there's limited time to address all of the legislation on the docket for this hearing. We applaud the forward movement of Council Member Rosenthal's resolution in support of federal legislation to name the Manhattan VA in honor of Revolutionary War hero Margaret Corbin, who was severely injured in combat in Washington Heights, Manhattan in November 1776. We are grateful for Senator Gillibrand, Senator Schumer, and Representatives Maloney, Espiat, Velasquez, and Nadler for championing this legislation and in reintroducing it in March. I have included with this testimony the white paper on Margaret Corbin and women's access to VA health care that we produced last fall, which precipitated the federal legislation. And I'm also including the fact sheet we presented to the New York City Veterans Advisory Board in March to dispel misinformation being spread about my organization's painstaking work to press forward this initiative to make Manhattan the first VA campus system-wide to be named in honor of a woman veteran. The sheet also includes statements of support from advocacy organizations, including those sitting here today, uh, and city and state officials and members of Congress. We urge this committee and the full council to pass this resolution in support of bringing the important legacy of Margaret Corbin to light and recognizing that women have been fighting for our nation since 1776. We further applaud and urge passage of Council Member Cabrera's worthy recognition of the heroes and historic actions that took place during the D-Day invasion 75 years ago. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Pending your questions, this concludes my testimony.
Uh, thank you, uh, Christine. Um, just want to say thank you for your support and advocacy on uh, Margaret Corbin uh, renaming rededication. I have a, in my district, I think I mentioned um, to you before that I have one street that I rededicated um, to Margaret Corbin uh, just a few years ago. Nicely done. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? No, Comments? Thank you. Thank you for your service and thank you for all that you do on behalf of veterans and their families. And I look forward to working with you more. All right. Thank, uh, thank you all uh, for coming here today. Happy Memorial Day. And, uh, and, and thanks for all your support uh, throughout the year. Uh, th this uh, hearing is now adjourned.